Okay, welcome back. Today we're looking at Jeremy Duff, Elements of New Testament Greek, section 3.4. This is headed The Vocative. I want to explain briefly what it is, and I want to give you some tips for how to deal with it. Now then, briefly, so what is the vocative? The vocative is a fifth case in Greek, which is used whenever you want to address somebody. So, for example, if I wanted to say, Lord, then I would say, Kyria, in the vocative. If I wanted to say, Brothers, if I was perhaps addressing a group of people, I wanted to say brothers, I would say Adelphoi in the vocative. So it's a fifth case, it's sometimes just called the case of address. Now, what tends to happen at this point when we introduce a fifth case in Greek is uh, that some of the students at the back of the class start to roll their eyes and say, for goodness sake, come on, you said there were four cases, nominative, accusative, genitive, dative. Why on earth are you introducing a fifth case now? Is there gonna be a sixth and a seventh like you get in Latin? The answer is, no, there isn't. This is the fifth and final one that you're gonna to have to learn. And the reason why we don't include it in the normal list of four is because it's not really necessary to do so, for several reasons. The first reason why it's not normally necessary to include it in the list of four is that it would be a waste of effort because the plural is exactly the same in form as the nominative. So there's no need to repeat yourself again. It is true that the singular has a different form from the nominative, and as Duff explains, for words like logos and kurios, um, obviously you're never going to want to be addressing a word, but you might want to address your lord. So a word like kurios in the nominative, the vocative form is kurie. Come to that in a second because that's quite important. Uh, so there is a, a new form to learn in the, the nominative singular of some words. Actually, Duff doesn't mention this, but some uh, other words not like logos and kurios have a slightly different form in the, the vocative. But again, don't worry about that. They're very rare. We'll get to them. So that's the first reason why we don't bother to uh, learn it as a separate case, so to speak. The second reason I've hinted at already, which is that this uh, the vocative case is really rare. In the New Testament, the vocative occurs, well, it depends how you count it, really, but it's uh, somewhere between 350, well, 320, 450 times, that kind of thing. Much less than 1% of all the nouns in the New Testament are in the vocative. Now, that's a really helpful thing to note because that means the way we're going to handle this is slightly different. We're not going to drill ourselves going around five cases every time you learn a new, new um, declension for a noun. We're just going to learn a couple of rules to help you to handle the vocative in practice. So first, um, think about uh, how you might actually use this word be, in, in, in the real life of reading the New Testament. You're going to use the vocative whenever you want to speak to somebody. So who's the person in the New Testament that people speak to most of the time and address in this kind of way? The one person that people speak to more than any other single individual is, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ, if they're speaking to a single individual. And therefore, it should come as no surprise to you to know that the most common vocative in the New Testament is this one, kurie, kurie. And that's fantastically useful, firstly, because that's really easy to remember Kurie from kurios meaning Lord, and if you uh, come from any kind of high church tradition, or even if you've ever listened to any classical Christian music, then you will know that the Kyrie eleison, which, uh, oh, I won't bother to write it down, oh, here it is, look, Kyrie eleison, Kyrie eleison is the title for a piece of Christian liturgy and also for some pieces of Christian music, which means Lord have mercy, addressing the Lord, Kyrie. Kyrie. Okay, so that's fairly simple to remember, and that also helps you to remember the vocative form in the singular. Kyrie, Kyrie. So there's really nothing to worry about here. Now, just to give you an example of how you would use this in practice, here's a sentence that uses Kyrie in the vocative. Let's just go through it and briefly translate it. Kyrie, blepo, ton, anthropon. Kyrie, Blepo, ton, anthropon. Let's just translate this. I'm sure you can do this by now. Find the verb, always the first thing to do. The verb is, pause the video and find it for yourself. The verb is right here. Blepo, first person, present tense, singular, meaning I see. That's the verb. Uh, is there a subject? Well, there's not gonna be a subject, at least not one that you've discovered at this stage in the course, because the subject is I, it's embedded in the verb itself, and therefore it's not gonna be lexicalized separately because it's the first person. If it were lexicalized separately, it'd be the third person. So I see, that's verb, subject, what's the object? Noun in the accusative, can you find a noun in the accusative? Of course you can, ton, anthropon, from ho, and from anthropos, meaning the man. So I see the man. 
and then now following the pattern that we're uh, trying to be disciplined with in how you translate, you go verb, subject, object, then you do everything else. What's everything else? Well, here is Lord in the vocative case. Now, the, the exclamation mark, um, you might put it in there, you might not, depending on the context in which you're translating it into English, but something like, Lord, I see the man. That's what's meant here. So that's, if you can remember Kyrie from Kyrie eleison, Lord, then you've just nailed one third of all the vocatives in the New Testament, which is really pretty helpful. Now, uh, there is a remaining uh, slightly tricky situation that you're going to find, which is uh, when you have other vocatives, and especially other vocatives in the plural. Because you remember I said, and, and Duff mentions this again, page 38, that plural vocatives have the same form as plural nominatives. So the sharp-eyed among you might say, well, that's all very well, at least I don't have to learn a new form, but how do I tell the difference? How do I tell the difference between a, a vocative plural and a nominative plural if they're the same in form? Now, here's the key thing I want to help you with uh, on this question, and this is a useful tip to remember. The way you tell the difference between uh, a vocative and a nominative in a sentence, if you find something that looks like a nominative plural, but there is no verb of which it could be the subject, then you're dealing with a vocative. Let me say that again. If you find a verb that looks like a nominative plural, but there, a, 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 a verb? <laughs> if you find a noun which looks like a nominative plural, but there is no verb of which it could be the subject, then you're dealing with a vocative. And there is one word which appears more often in that context in the New Testament than any other, and it is the word Adelphoi. This appears, I think, even more than Kyrie. And about 116 times, I think, um, Kyrie is 113, and 106 or so of those are in the plural form, Adelphoi, as a vocative, so if you can figure out how to handle this, then again, you're another third of the way to handling all the vocatives in the New Testament. So let's just read this and translate this as an example, just to show you. Here we go. Adelphoi acuais tus angelus. Question. Remember the question mark at the end. We'll come to that in a second. Adelphoi acuais tus angelus. Question mark. So let's translate it. What do we do first? Discipline yourself. Always do it this way and you won't go so far wrong. Find the verb. The verb is acuais from akuo, meaning I hear, but now we go through the conjugation, akuo, akuais, akue, akuomen, akuete, akurusin, akuo, akuais is a second person singular, meaning you hear. Verb, subject, is it going to have a separately lexicalized subject? No, there's the clue that we'll come to with the vocative in a moment, because it's you, second person. So verb, subject, object, that's easy. Tus angelus comes from ho, the angelos, the angel or the messenger. But this is accusative plural, it's the object. So you hear the angels. But then we remember it's a question. So we turn the verb into an English question form of the verb. And the way you do that is right, do you hear the angels? So, here's a sentence so far, aquais tus angelus, do you hear the angels? Now, here's the word you've got left over, and this is the one that when you first glanced at the sentence, you were thinking, oh, it looks like a nominative. Oh, but then you just remembered it could be a vocative, because nominative plural and vocative plural look the same. So how can you tell that this is a vocative and not a nominative? It's very simple. If it were a nominative, it would have to be the subject of a verb. But this can't be the subject of the verb, the only verb in the sentence, because this verb is not in the third person. If this verb were in the third person, and indeed the third person plural, because of the plural ending on Adelphoi, if this were in the third person plural, then this could be the subject of it and could be the nominative. But because this is in the second person, and it's in the singular as well, this cannot be its subject. And therefore, it can't be the nominative, and if it can't be the nominative, if it looks like a nominative but can't be the nominative, it's going to be evocative. So, this means brothers. In the sense of, brothers, do you hear the angels? You're addressing the brothers. And therefore, it's an evocative case. So that's a helpful hint 
or tip, I hope, for how to handle the fact that the vocative plural, like brothers, is the same in form as the nominative plural. Now, just take stock of where you got to so far. Just by remembering kurie from kurie eleison, and it's kurios in the vocative form, that's one third of all the vocatives you're ever going to encounter. Another third of them are adelphoi as uh, vocative plural, which you can distinguish from the many, many more occurrences of the nominative plural adelphoi from the fact that it can't be the subject of the verb in the sentence in which it occurs. So that's pretty much nailed two-thirds of the occurrences of vocative and you've only needed two words. All the rest you're going to have to just spot and you will learn to spot them because you'll get familiar with this ending even though it occurs fairly rarely. But just to show you the kind of thing where you could easily trip up and this is just to uh, highlight it is a bit of a strange thing to look for. Let's take this final example and when people see this for the first time they normally go what on earth is that? Huye to theu. This is not a complete sentence, there's no verb in it, either stated or implied. Huye to theu. Now I promise you, if you've been learning your vocab, you know all these words. You know theu from theos, meaning God. You know tu from ho, meaning the, but it's in the genitive. So um, this is uh, of, literally or woodenly, of the God. But you know now also that the article is sometimes used... Um, in Greek with a proper name or like God where it's not translated into English. So the way we would translate this is almost always of God, to theu. But what on earth is this? Well, this is the vocative form of huios. Can you see? You know, you see it's slightly tricky because you're so unused to seeing that ending that when you do encounter it, you'll think, oh, it's just some strange word, I've never encountered it. And then when you see a word that you don't uh, know how to handle in a sentence, your eyes will glaze over and you'll worry and you'll move on to the next question, you won't even have a crack at it. So just be aware, this is the kind of strangeness to look for when you're, uh, now that you're aware of the existence of the vocative, and it is difficult because it occurs quite rarely, and so you need to just be alert for it. So this means, um, O oh, son of God, or something of that kind. You're addressing son of God. And this happens a few times in the Gospels. You've got seven or eight occurrences of this. Uh, one final thing. Duff says that um, sometimes the vocative marker O occurs with the vocative, like in Acts chapter 1 verse 1, uh, O Theophilus. And that's true, but again, that's very infrequent. It's something like 10 or 11 occurrences in the New Testament. Um, but the great thing about this, you just translate it how it sounds, O, uh, distinct from that, which is a very different word, which we'll come to at some point in the future, but O, oh, just with a smooth breathing, meaning like O, oh. <laughs> like, like in old-fashioned King James English, O Theophilus, uh, or O oh Lord, or something like that. Okay, so there we are. That's some things to help you deal with the vocative. Uh, we're going to come back in the next session, uh, in the next video, and we'll look at uh, section 3.6 on Jesus, the name of our Lord himself. But for now, keep working hard, keep um, uh, going on with your 20 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day, five or six days a week, and I promise you, working like that will have you reading the New Testament in no time at all. Okay, any comments and questions below, uh, anything you want us to talk about in any of these videos, and we'll soon get to the end of chapter three and have you cracking on into chapter four. Okay, God bless, and see you next time. Bye for now.